Welcome to Free Thoughts. I'm Aaron Powell. And I'm Trevor Burris. Our guest today is Eamon Butler. He's director and co-founder of the Adam Smith Institute, and he's also the author of many books. His latest is Ayn Rand, An Introduction, published just this week by the Institute for Economic Affairs and Libertarianism.org. Welcome to Free Thoughts, Eamon. Yes, hello. Welcome. Maybe a good place to start is with Rand's early life um, and how how did her early life, how did her experiences in Russia and then coming to the US influence her fiction and her philosophy? Oh, profoundly, I think. Um, she was, uh, of course, born in uh, uh, 1905 in uh, St. Petersburg, um, uh, which is, uh, of course, in, in Russia. And uh, this was, of course, just before the uh, Russian Revolution. So. Uh, when she was uh, just about 10, 10 or 11, uh, she saw the, the Russian Revolution breaking out. And of course, it broke out uh, predominantly uh, starting in, uh, in St. Petersburg itself. Um, so <clears throat> she came from a, uh, a, it was a Jewish family and her father ran a, uh, a pharmacy shop. And when the um, revolution broke out, of course, um, uh, they, they tried to escape. They went uh, briefly to the Crimea, um, and uh, because, because her father's uh, business was nationalised, taken over by the uh, revolutionary government, uh, and then in Crimea the same happened again. When the Red Army got to Crimea, they took his business again. Um, so they returned to uh, St. Petersburg, and of course she grew up uh, during those years when. Uh, the uh, communists were, were trying to build a new order, but of course it, it was an absolute disaster. It was, it was shortages and injustices um, and summary killings and, and all the rest of it, and, and, uh, and people with property and businesses were uh, dis disinherited. So um, she saw that as a sort of profound injustice uh, that uh, people who really had no claim at all were taking uh, property and indeed taking the lives of people who were simply trying to um, fend for themselves, build up a business, improve life for, for themselves and their families. And she found that terribly unjust, unjust. and um, it really colored the rest of her, her writings um, where she's very strongly in favor of the individual who can um, uh, build up his or her own uh, business, her, his or her own life, uh, family, mm -hmm. uh, and everything else that's important to people, um, and that they should be able to do that without uh, people coming along um, and simply take, taking uh, those things away from you. So um, yes, it was a very profound um, upbringing. And then, of course, uh, from there she went to, um, uh, to university and uh, discovered lots of uh, interesting novelists, which again uh, colored her writings like, like uh, Victor Hugo and so on. But she also discovered um, the Greek philosopher Aristotle and, and other people who informed her uh, philosophy. Uh, and then she went to, um, she, she rather cleverly got a visa um, to go to America. You had to get a visa to leave uh, Russia uh, then, but um, she wanted to uh, she enrolled in, in a, a state cinematic uh, institute and uh, got this visa in order to go to America and uh, in order to, to study uh, film. And uh, on that uh, visa, eventually she, she met an actor in Hollywood. Um, she uh, became uh, married and, and became an American citizen and spent the less, rest of her life in, uh, in America. So... Uh, an interesting upbringing, and uh, it brought something new to America. This is the sort of way of thinking, uh, the, the Russian way of writing and so on, uh, which was completely new in America. So it was uh, quite an important influence in the rest of her life. Was she first, her first love, it, it kind of seems like it was movies maybe, or, and then she was writing novels later, and she definitely seemed enthralled by movies, and she, she was involved with more mo more movie making experiences than a lot of people might realize. Oh yes, absolutely. In fact, when she came to America, she stayed with some relatives in uh, I think it was in Chicago, uh, and they actually owned a cinema. So she said that she spent uh, um, a long a long while um, in uh, the, the cinema there, just going going through lots and lots and lots of, of different uh, films. 
Um, so yes, that was very very important to it. You see, this was a new new medium. I think Rand loved things that were sort of new and obviously loved things that were kind of rational. So when she landed in New York in 1926, it wasn't a very nice day. It was a winter's day, but she was just overwhelmed by the skyline, which to her was just you know, rational and logical, uh, but also heroic. Uh, and, and that is, I think, what uh, people in, were trying to produce in, the, in, in movies uh, at the time. And, uh, and as I say, in, in Chicago, one of her relatives owned the movie theater, and so she indulged that passion, uh, borrowed some money off the relative, and went to uh, California to try to make her uh, fortune. You know, she had no no idea of doing what she was supposed to do under the visa, which was to study American film, then go back. You know, she I think she, at that stage she knew that she wanted uh, to live in America rather than this uh, catastrophic and unjust. Uh, nation that was being built in in Russia. And on her second day in Hollywood, she just happened to, to run into um, Cecil B. DeMille, who was a lead, leading uh, filmmaker, film director. And he uh, he hired as a, uh, first as an extra. Um, and then that's where she met her future husband, uh, Frank uh, O'Connor. Um, and she she wrote lots of screenplays for films um, uh, during that during that period, so it was very much you know for many many years, it was really what she did. She was uh, she was in movies. She was writing screenplays, editing screenplays, uh, tightening up screenplays, and and that sort of thing. Is that then what led her to make? I mean, the the kind of out of the ordinary decision for people who have grand philosophies they want to express, which is to, you know, she wrote novels instead of writing philosophical tracks. I mean, she wrote some of those, but those came later. Like, was that, was it just that that was what she loved and fiction was what she thought? Or did she, like, you know, how fiction was the way she knew how to express herself? Or was there some other motive behind that? Some, you know, thinking that fiction was maybe a better way to get these ideas across? Yes. It's one of these things where people say, well, you know, did she write um, novels in order to express her philosophy? And what she actually said was that, um, no, no, I had to develop the philosophy in order to, to write my novels uh, and that uh, novel writing was, was what, what she wanted to do. I mean, she finished her first novel in 1934 or so. I mean, she was not even in, in her 30s, um, but um, uh, and, and, and which was and that was a sort of brutal portrayal of life in, in the new Soviet Union. Um, and it was very much at odds with, with what uh, Americans and Westerners at the time thought the Soviet Union was all about. And they, they saw it as a, as a sort of heroic, even the middle class intellectual saw it uh, as a kind of uh, uh, you know, wonderful experiment kind of thing. But she, having lived through it, knew that it was uh, an absolute uh, disaster. So she wrote this, what we would call in, in America or, or the UK where I live, we would call this um, a philosophical novel. Um, and it's unusual in, in America. It's unusual in Britain. It's unusual in the West. Um, but it's very commonplace in, in Russia that you, you have this novel which somehow sort of expresses a, a philosophy and the philosophy informs the characters and all the rest of it. So... Um, uh, and then she followed that up with another novel just um, uh, two years later. Um, so, uh, yes, writing fiction, I think, was very much what she was good at and, and wanted to do. And I think the although she said, you, you know, the, the, the sort of philosophy um, came, came out of that, I, I think it's uh, I'm not I'm not sure quite how how closely they're related and. Uh, she she was good at that novel, and I, and, I, and, I, and I think that the philosophy sort of was came later, and it was added on later, and she thought about it later, and you know, sadly, I mean, she she died really before she could um, complete a lot of the of the, of the thinking and and and, and write a, a real treatise that it, that explained her philosophy in philosophical terms. So we we've, we've got the books to go on, but <laughs> not a great deal of other things. One of the distinctive things about objectivists, uh, Randians, is it's a fairly t today in her, uh, it's a fairly total philosophy. Um, I've had there's some of the rifts between different uh, factions of objectivists and also libertarians and objectivists often 
hinge upon the fact of not uh, uh, accepting the whole thing soup to nuts. So let's get into some of the, the soup to nuts, so to speak, um, and that it includes a metaphysics and an epistemology and a morality and a politics. So what what did Rand view as metaphysics as the is the ultimate nature of reality, so to speak? Well, uh, it's interesting, just uh, as an aside, I mean, you talked about the sort of rifts between uh, Rand and, and within Rand's uh, circle, and those were very current. In fact, um, when I was um, uh, at university and, and just you know, sort of starting to read these things, um, it's one of the things that put me off. Uh, and I, I didn't come back to it until many, many years later, because it just seemed so factional and so personal and people were either in or they were out and you had to take the whole thing. Or you, and if you didn't take the whole thing, um, then you were somehow heretical and, and, and you couldn't, couldn't be talked to at all. So there was that, that sort of sectarianism about it, which I found deeply unattractive. But I, I can see why, because um, to her, as you rightly say, um, this whole thing is, is a comprehensive uh, unit. Um, her metaphysics, you know, what is the nature of the universe? Well, to her, it's objective reality. That's it. There's an objective world out there. How do we know about that universe, epistemology? Well, we can only know about it by reason, by applying reason to, to, to what we see. And then uh, from that, she goes on to the principles by which we should live. You should live according in, in a way which is, um, uh, which is true to, to, that, to that reality. And to her, that means uh, the principles of self-interest. And then that brings her on to politics, uh, where again, it's sort of self-interest in, in social organization, which means capitalism. Um, and, and she also bolts on uh, romanticism in, in, in art. But, but those are the main things, objective reality, reason, self-interest, capitalism, everything hangs together. And this is actually, I think, what makes Rand's ideas so attractive, particularly, I think, to, to the young, because they're looking for an answer to everything. And she kind of gives you an answer to everything. This is all joined up. If you, the world works in this way. We have to live uh, by these principles in order to be at one with the world. When when it comes to metaphysics, that that uh, reality exists, or there is such thing as objective reality. I mean, we know about philosophers, whether it's like Bishop Berkeley or people who said that you know could be idealism might be a thing, but that doesn't seem you know. But, terribly unique. I think most philosophers would say that something called reality exists. D did Was there something distinctive about the way that, that she made this claim? Um, I don't know that it was distinct. It's very, it's, it, it, it's quite an old idea. I mean, I, I say it goes back to um, Aristotle and so on, and some, some of the Greek uh, philosophers. So, um, so they, uh, yes, yeah, so you, you're right. Realism, as it's, as it's called in philosophical circles, um, is quite uh, has quite a long standing. I think that uh, the reason that it was interesting is because um, sort of empirical philosophy was was uh, ruling the roost. Then you had people like uh, um, F. A. Hayek and, and and so on who were steeped really in the the Scottish um, empirical school, which is that um, we don't actually know the world. Um, all we can do is make guesses about it. And uh, we try those guesses. And if they work, then we do more of them. And if they don't work, then we do less of them. And that's how we find out about the, the world. And people like Karl Popper, the uh, Austrian um, uh, philosopher of science, uh, again, saying that's how science works. You, it's, it's a web of guesses. And uh, we don't know what the world is like, but we, we have a guess and uh, uh, we test those guesses, we, we do experiments and see whether they stand up. And if they don't, uh, then we abandon them and, and uh, make, make another guess. Um, and, and Rand is sort of coming from it the other way around and saying, no, no, there is an objective world there. We can sort of understand it by um, using our reason to clarify um, how it works and, and, and what it's all about. So. You know, is it something which is out there that through applying your mind, you can work out what the reality is, like working out a mathematical proof? Or is it something you don't know what it is and you just have to stick your finger in it and see whether it hurts? What reason does she give or have for thinking that 
human reason is capable of that. So I mean, we can, you know, we could say like, you know, a dog, a dog's mind. We, as you know, higher beings than a dog, can look at a dog and say that there are there are lots of things about the world that that dog not only can't figure out, but can't figure out that it can't figure out. It can't even be aware that it can't figure them out because its brain just lacks the capacity to to understand the nature of reality. Um, and so we're certainly, you know, I mean, smarter than a dog. But Some is, there, most of us. is there a reason to believe that we – our brains are so powerful? Like that they're just kind of as good as it can get and that they're capable of understanding everything. And because that – to me, that seems, seems like a very large claim that I'm not sure how you would even set out to, to prove. Yes. Well, I think that that's actually a very telling uh, criticism. Um, because uh, I, I mean, if you if you look, I mentioned uh, F. A. Hayek. If you look at uh, um, his view on um, epistemology, you know, how we how we get to, uh, to knowledge about the universe, um, he says um, our minds uh, don't sort of float above reality. We can't hover above reality, looking down to see see what it is. Our minds have actually been created by this universe because we've evolved as uh, um, complicated um, social beings. And as part of that, we have uh, a mind which works in particular ways. Uh, and it works in particular ways because um, it, it, it manages to, to deal with the universe fairly, um, uh, fairly well. And uh, therefore, we're sort of part of this world which we're trying to understand and 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 therefore it's it, in, inevitably um, we can't separate ourselves from it and say well there's an objective reality out there um, and we can somehow detect that so I think I think that's actually quite a, uh, a telling uh, criticism and I don't know that she overcomes it I mean she again one of one of her failings is that she doesn't um, uh, if you like, debate with other philosophers um, uh, very much. She she tends to like a few philosophers, and everybody else she kind of dismisses as, as how these people are just wrong and they've they've taken things on the on the wrong term, rather than sort of going through their arguments and trying to to meet them. So I I think that's actually a very telling telling proposition. What 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 she says is, of course, that okay, we are human beings, right, you know, we, we may have our limitations. The question for us is, how do we human beings make our world our way in whatever it is that's out there? And she says the only way that we can do that is to apply our reason to the best of our ability. We might not always get it right, uh, and we don't get it right, and, and we have to abandon uh, things uh, that are proved to be mistaken. But um, only by uh, using our reason will we get anything close to understanding what the world is like and therefore how we should live within it. Before we move on to her, to her moral philosophy, since we're on metaphysics and epistemology, uh, I want to ask you about something that I, I've heard Randians and objectivists say quite often, which is A equals A. Uh, there's a particular, even there's a sort of notorious, at least for me, Leonard Peikoff interview on Bill O'Reilly about 15 years ago during the uh, outset of the Iraq war, I believe. And they're talking about bombing Iran, I think. And O'Reilly asked them some questions and well, what, what about what if this happened? And, and Peikoff's answer is, well, what if A didn't equal A? Uh, and I, I've heard this in response as like it's a very strange way of, of addressing a criticism. What if A didn't equal A? Why, why is that something that, that uh, Randians uh, commonly say? Let, let me just go through the, uh, this. There are sort of basic axioms, with it, she says. First, we know that things exist. Um, our brains make us aware that there's a world out there. We don't necessarily know their exact nature, how they behave, but we know they're there. So to her, she says, existence exists. Secondly, we're aware that things are exist. We perceive them. Um, so there must be something out there because we can't be conscious of nothing. We have to be conscious of something. So we know that there's something out there. Um, and third, um, to be something, she says, implies that that thing has an identity. It has a collection of qualities that distinguish it as a particular thing and not something else. 
Um, so uh, a, a tree has particular um, uh, characters that you and I don't have. You know, a tree has roots that go into the ground and so on, and, and we don't, and it has leaves and we don't. It has a whole variety of, uh, um, uh, of characteristics which other things don't have. So that brings her back to, again, it goes back to Aristotle, um, the idea that existence is identity, that um, something is what it is, it can't be anything else. Uh, and that is what she calls the, the law of identity. Um, I, I, I'm, I'm very skeptical of this uh, line of her reasoning myself. I, I think that this is this is about words rather than things, and it's about how we try to identify things, um, and quite often we get it wrong. Uh, so, uh, you know, is, is there something that is specific out there? It's got certain irredeemable, um, irreducible qualities, and somehow we get to know that, or do we just have to make a guess, and, and often there are deep boundaries, you know, what's the difference between a stool and a chair? Well, a chair has a back, but supposing the back's only a small back, is that still a chair or does it then become a stool? And it just depends on how we choose to think about these things and how, how we find it convenient to refer to them. It's not necessarily something which is kind of out there and, and objective. So that's the, the sort of criticism that people would make of that argument. Moving into her morality, uh, so we have... Uh, three basic questions of philosophy. What is there? How do we know about it? And what do you do about it? Uh, metaphysics, epistemology, and morals. So where, where did she go after saying there's reality, we have awareness of it, and we can use reason? What does that mean for what you should do about things, about your life? Well, yes, well, well, uh, moral values and actions are extremely important to human beings, according to, to Rand, because... Um, Uniquely among living things, we have the ability to choose how we behave, how we treat others, and, and the virtues and, and ideals to which we aspire. Um, so if we're going to make good moral choices, um, we need to make another choice, which is to think objectively. That is to use our reason and focus it on establishing what she says is the true nature of things without evading, without drifting, uh, and without get, getting confused. And when she uh, boils that down, she says, well, what is the ends to which people should live? And the answer is life. That's, that's, that's our highest value. That's what we're aiming for. Um, by what principle should we act in order to achieve that end of life? Well, the answer is use our reason, use your brain. And who should we focus at, uh, our actions at, at, at improving? You know, whose life are we talking about here? Um, who should profit from your actions? And the answer is yourself, not anybody else. So her view is that in order to be consistent with uh, this real world, um, we should be pursuing life. We should be using reason to work out how to achieve life. And um, the person that we're doing this for is basically ourselves, not for other people. One thing that I f often find puzzling about this aspect of Rand's moral theory, and I know that this is a this is an issue that there's some debate on among Rand scholars, is is this life as the standard of value, because she has. She has a very robust and expansive moral theory that says there are certain kinds of things you ought to do and there are certain ways that you ought to behave and it's wrong to behave in other ways. But it's not entirely clear to me how that stuff can be derived just from the notion of life or survival. So I mean to put it, you know, the very obvious counterexample would be there have been billions and billions of people who have lived very long lives and I, and didn't know about or didn't follow Rand's moral rules. And so it's it's not clear that the relationship between following the rules of objectivism and living because clearly there are non-objectivists who still live. So is there something more to just – is this not just a mere survival standard? Is there something more like a baked in, you know, to put in Aristotelian terms like a, a flourishing or a eudaimonia or like a, a life that is – the right kind of life? Well, she says you should live according to your rational 
self-interest. And um, the important thing there is rational. Um, you know, she she doesn't advocate that people should just uh, um, dissolve into hedonism and and uh, drink alcohol and smoke uh, cigars and and uh, um, uh, act in ways that that are irresponsible. Um, she says you need to work out what is, what is uh, right for you um, in in the long term, and uh, your ultimate uh, value might be uh, life, but uh, there are things that you have to do in order to um, to uh, achieve that in in the long long term, and your long term happiness, uh, which is another important factor for her, um, depends upon uh, doing doing the right things, if you like, the, the rational things, rather than just doing whatever comes into your head as though it would be nice to do this today. Why don't I just do this and get, get myself uh, completely blind drunk or, or get my, myself onto heroin and have a, have a nice day? Because in the long term, that is damaging for you um, and, and it will achieve the opposite of what you want to achieve. But I think, you know, you are, I think, again, you've, you've, you, you've got it quite right that this it, it, the life standard is a difficult one because most moral decisions that we make aren't, aren't matters of life and death. You know, it may be that you could say, well, um, you know, we really ought to be honest because if we weren't honest, then in the long run, uh, we'd never get on together and we'd never be able to do anything and we would die because we couldn't uh, cooperate and all, and all the rest of it. That may be true. But in a particular instance, you know, um, Okay, I've uh, taken something from my uh, young son because I think it's bad for for him. Um, do I? Uh, and he asks where it is. Uh, what do I do? Do I say it's lost, or do I say I've taken taken it from you um, because I think it's bad for you? No, well, you, you lie. <laughs> I mean, parents do, and in many cases, um, you have to lie. Now, is 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 that good, or is it or is it bad? Is it pro life or anti life? Well, you know, it's very difficult to say that this that, that a little thing like that, you know, telling a fib to your son really for his own best interest, it's a difficult to, to say something like that is is a matter of life and death. But this is this is Rand's ultimate uh, standard. When she says selfishness, she has a book called The Virtue of Selfishness, a collection of essays, and a lot of people take that and read. A bunch, a bunch into it, uh, and say that that means uh, you you will do anything whatsoever to preserve your life. Like I don't know, George Costanza on Seinfeld or something. Not even care about anyone else. But what what does she mean by selfishness in in her? We kind of got into a little bit, but in her specific definition of that term. Well, what she means is pursuing your own values. Now, your values are not necessarily simply. Um, your own life and welfare. It may be, um, you know, I, I mean, as, as she said herself, when her husband uh, died, um, I have lost my greatest value. Um, so there are other things. You know, other people are important to, to you. Principles are important to you. The fact that the world is is working in some particular way is important to you. And, and people will spend a lot of time and energy and effort in trying to um, well, you know, convince people of political philosophies or clean up the planet or tell people that they shouldn't throw litter and, and all sorts of things like that, because these are very high values to them. And, and, and uh, in many cases, the, the welfare of other people is a high value. And, uh, you know, I, I, I think uh, that I, one of the criticisms I would make Rand is that she, te she tends to draw human beings as rather individualists. Whereas we have grown up as a, a social species, and the welfare of other people is actually very important to us. So you know, it's, it's important how um, other people uh, live and how we get on with other people and uh, uh, their their happiness and, and uh, uh, life and so on is is important to us. Well, you know, she says if if that's important to you, that's what you should actually be uh, focusing on. So so it's so it's your your values that you should focus on, not necessarily, you know, your own life, because if you lose your greatest value, you, you may conclude that your life um, now has no meaning. Um, so in, in many cases, uh, um, suicide, for example, is perfectly rational, according on, on the Rand uh, thinking. Um, so it, it's your individual 
that is the end. Well, and on, so on the flip side of that, she, she has a specific definition of altruism too, which she views as an evil in the way she defines it. But, but as you pointed out, it doesn't mean just caring about people, which it's okay to care about people if it's your values. It means something else. Yes, that's right. Yes, I, uh, you know, what she, her, her worry about altruism, well, many, she has many worries about altruism, um, but she thinks it's, um, she thinks it's a, an evil, actually. Um, you know, she thinks that the prevailing morality, and you get this in religion and uh, but many other forms of reality, um, they urge us to live for the benefit of others rather than ourselves. They, they praise self-sacrifice. And they, they say that self-serving things that benefit you are immoral. Um, and uh, that means, she says, that the standard of morality, morality then is not the, the, the value of the action is itself, but the identity of who benefits. And, and according to that, serving others is good, serving yourself is bad. And she says uh, on that criterion, there's really nothing to choose between gangsters and business people. They're, they're both evil because they're both self-interested. Um, and she thinks that that's just, uh, of course, completely wrong. There is uh, uh, a big difference between gangsters and business people. Gangsters exploit other people um, through violence and force. And business people enrich other people through voluntary exchange. There's no moral equivalent, of, uh, equivalent at all. Um, and she says you shouldn't. In, uh, confuse altruism with kindness, goodwill, or respect for other, others. We can all do that. Its core demand is self-sacrifice, which means self-denial. Um, so that, if you like, makes morality everybody's enemy. To be moral, you have to do what's bad for you. And she says that's no way to live, and it's certainly not consistent with the way we're, we're created and the way the world works. How do we get from that to then you said so like the problem with with gangsters is that they exploit other people for their their own ends um, but how is that wrong within this system as it's set out because if if i if i'm morally obligated to do what's of value to me um, there may be instances where i could say steal something from trevor because then it will enable me to do something that fulfills my principles or my values more so why should i why should i respect rights in this system especially when respecting rights in a given instance would be harmful to me yeah uh, she draws the line at force um it, it's the use of force uh, which she thinks is 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 one of the the, the greatest uh, uh, evils um the we can get along very well um, by mutual cooperation and uh, you know, just just simply get, getting along with each other. Um, when you start to use force, then there's no end to it, um, and uh, that way lies tyranny. And being brought up in the early uh, Soviet Union, that's not the place that she wants to be. She sees. Uh, a world which is morally superior in that it doesn't have, it, it's not founded on force. That's why she is so pro-capitalism, pro, so pro-laissez-faire capitalism, because there's no force involved. It's entirely um, voluntary. You trade with people or you don't trade with people. It's up to you. Um, so what she's against is people being told that they have to make a sacrifice to, to others and certainly being forced to make a sacrifice to others. Um, so uh, th that, to her, I think is is, is the greatest evil. It, it's uh, it's the it's the use of force, and there's no once you start on that road, there's no limit. This defense of capitalism that comes that comes from her and objectivists, it it has a little bit of a different flavor. We put together the pieces here from metaphysics to epistemology, reason, self interest, but what we get from capitalism here is is less. Uh, hey, capitalism is good because uh, it helps the poor the best or it because uh, it makes goods cheaper or some sort of instrumental or consequentialist creates argument wealth. that creates wealth. It's something much more like capitalism is good because it is the moral truth of a human flourishing life and creating value and pursuing your own ends in like a heroic fashion is what makes it good, which is why sometimes Randians get mad when you use instrumental or consequentialist 
justifications for capitalism, which they get mad at us a lot. <laughs> well, I think I, I think both uh, should should be applauded, uh, quite frankly. And, and any defense of capitalism is good these days. Um, to to Rand, um, if you want a rational economic system, economics is really the science of uh, applying social principles to production, if you like. Um, that uh, if you want a rational economic system. Um, it's got to be rooted in the nature of the world, the nature of ourselves. And to be moral, um, it's got to respect our basic rights and it's, it's certainly got to avoid force. And the only system that does that, according to Rand, is laissez-faire capitalism. Um, laissez -faire, capitalism without government intervention. Um, because only capitalism respects people's property rights uh, and that makes it the only uh, moral system. It's also the only moral social system. Capitalism to her is a social system because it respects people's rights and, and their, their values and their, their, their right to, to, to have their own values. Um, but a, a capitalist, in a capitalist society, you can still value art or science or literature above material goods. It doesn't, it doesn't make you um, focus only on money. Um, people decide their own priorities. But in terms of production, that's the... That, that's the rational way. Uh, and I think uh, you are right. This, I, I think that, that her defense of capitalism is intriguing because it, it was um, so fresh and, uh, and, and, and new. And that, um, you know, she certainly argued that nobody had to sacrifice anything under, under capitalism. Uh, she saw that um, production itself was a virtue because it was, it, it was creative. And in her novels, it's the she, she applauds business people because they create something of value. The value doesn't grow on trees. You have to create it. And uh, capitalism is very good at creating effective, efficient uh, producers. Um, and it encourages. And the freedom that is around in capitalism encourages people to use their minds and apply their minds to problems. Um, so she's uh, very much in favor of uh, capitalism as, as the only moral system. But also, I think, you know, she does say that it, it, it actually produces the good, the goods. There is a bit of a tension, you're right, and people have debated this, you're right. But she actually, if you look at her writings, I think that she says, she says both. Firstly, it's a moral system. But secondly, you know, looking at the, her writings um, and articles, in particular on, say, Britain, and, oh, sorry, on America and, and Russia, you know, she's saying, well, the capitalist system is better. It's, it's producing more. It's, it's, it's doing better for people. People are richer. Um, so she is looking at the results as well as uh, looking at the, uh, the, the philosophy of it. It seems like there might be a tension here between her, her moral prohibitions on force and coercion that, that you know, once, you, once you allow those in, you're on your way to tyranny and – her rejection of anarchism, um, because I mean, we spend we spend a lot of time on free thoughts talking about the justifications for and the nature of the state, and and the state is effectively, I mean, by definition, is a group of people who have been empowered to or entitled to use force and coercion against other people, um, and so the anarchist would say, if you're you know opposed to those things, then you have to be opposed to the state. But she was pretty strongly not an anarchist. So how did she? How did she rectify that? Is that a tension? And if it is, how did she rectify it? Mm -hmm. Yes, it's um, well. You're you're right. She was uh, very critical of uh, anarchism and uh, famously split uh, from Mar Murray Rothbard, the uh, great thinker on anarcho-capitalism. Um, she rejected the idea that we don't need government at all. Uh, because she thought that that would expose us to um, predation by criminals. Um, and her view was, we, we can't be rational, we can't think, we can't uh, create, we can't produce if we are living in fear that other people are going to steal our things or, or assault us and uh, uh, take our property um, or our lives. Um, so we can't live as rational human beings if we are living in fear, having to carry arms with us, having to fortify our homes um, and, and to form gangs for our own protection. Um, and having a state of some sort, she, she believed, 
sent out a signal that there's no point in initiating force because force will be returned. And to her, the the sole purpose of, of the state was to um, to make sure that f- using force wasn't worthwhile because the state had more force and it would it, it, it would it would flatten you <laughs> if you tried it. Um, so uh, yes, I, I I think this is it is very difficult because. Again, many people have have argued that, well, you know, once you start saying, well, we need a state, then the argument is, well, where does that stop? Because uh, we've, you know, we've seen in the past that, um, I mean, countries like the United States, for example, have started with a, a, a fairly small government with very specific aims. And now, you know, it does just about everything, frankly, um, and, lots, and lots and lots and lots of things that it, it, it shouldn't do and which can't be justified under its founding principles. Um, so I, I think that is uh, 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 a bit of a problem in, uh, in, in Rand. You know, she called herself a, a radical for capitalism rather than an, an anarchist, because uh, simply because she, she thought that anarchism uh, just, just precluded having a state entirely and that you couldn't live without something which would protect you. Of course, Murray Rothbard would say, no, that's, that's no problem at all. People just get together and they, uh, and, and they hire people to protect them, just as they hire people to unblock their drains or fix their electricity. If you look at her books, as you mentioned, uh, especially The Fountainhead and Atlas Shrugged, the heroes are, are makers. They're people making things for some reason trains are really big deal and atlas shrugged and and they're architects and they're and they're people who are takers who are parasites who want to take what they produce this leads to a, a criticism especially in these sort of fraught inequality times we're talking about inequality a lot that 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 for therefore it implies that the distribution of wealth that results from a capitalist system is is morally justified that the people who have a lot of money at the top uh, deserve it because they're titans of industry and they're making things and they're heroic beings and the people who don't deserve it because they because they're not heroic beings beings and this is something you hear from like Robert Reich I think uh, made a criticism recently this is exactly what Mitt Romney's worldview is and what Paul Ryan's worldview is they're makers and they're takers is that a, is that a fair uh, criticism or description of the implications of her views? Uh, I think it's a fair uh, uh, description, yes. I think that, uh, I mean, Nozick uh, puts it, uh, Robert Nozick, uh, philosopher, put, puts it uh, quite well. He, you know, he says, you know, take um, you know, a basketball star or something, and um, people want to see this person play, um, so they, uh, they pay a few dollars and they go to the stadium and they watch the game. Um, and uh, they are each a few dollars poorer, and the basketball star is many thousands of dollars richer. But nobody has acted in an unjust way. Um, Nobody's been forced uh, to do anything. Um, So even if they started equal in terms of their incomes or wealth, they haven't finished equal. But if nobody's acted unjustly, how can that uh, resulting distribution um, be unjust itself? Uh, and so, uh, you know, Rand, I think, though, focuses really more on on those heroes themselves. And, you know, her heroes are individualists. They live by their own creative talents. So they, you know, they produce things which, which, of course, benefit all of us. They exist for nobody else but themselves. They don't ask other people um, to exist for them. Um, they're rebels. Uh, they don't conform to social norms, but they stand by their own vision. Um, and, and they understand, they, they have a version of truth in their minds, they understand it and they build um, their vision and their values, um, on, their, their vision on those values and on that truth of facts and reason uh, and not on the false authority of others. So they're creative minds who do, and, and, and that means they're discovering new things, they're, they're discovering new knowledge, they innovate and therefore they drive progress. And that consequently benefits all humanity. Um, and you can't do that, of course, if you're, you, you can't force people to do that. Creativity depends upon being free to act and think. And this is, this is why she's so strong on, on capitalism as a, a moral system. It leaves you free to, to think, free to act. And then you, yes, you pursue your own values and you, you benefit accordingly. Uh, of course, it may be 
and a lot of I, I've known a lot of very rich people, and uh, indeed they're so rich they can't actually they don't have time to spend what it is they've made. So what do they do? The answer is that they set up charitable foundations or they uh, they, they do other things in order to uh, to use that money and to promote causes which uh, thereby promote their own values. You know, if Bill Gates thinks it's important to wipe out malaria in the developing world, he gives his fortune to causes like that. Um, and in, in so doing, benefits a lot of people in the developing world. What do you think is the biggest, I mean, it, it depends on which side it's coming from, of course, but the biggest misconception of Rand, there's a, there's a, a ton of them. She kind of operates as a, a figure that, you know, can sort of put everyone, like I said, Paul Ryan and everyone who believes in capitalism for many people on the left are just unrepentant Randians who want the poor to die. But if, if all these kind of misconceptions are out there, what do you think is the, the, the most pernicious one? Yes, I, I think I think it's that that um, that that life is all about selfishness. That uh, um, it, it, the language is unfortunate. We don't really have anything which which sort of a simple word that expresses what what she's she's trying to get at. But what she's trying to get at is we should live we should live for ourselves. Now we're complicated creatures, and yes, we do actually value what others think and what others do, uh, and, and so on. Uh, and we value some people more than we value others, but we should live for those values. And in doing that, we will actually create a better world. We'll create a better human society um, because we will be encouraging the things that we ought to encourage and we'll be discouraging the things which should be discouraged. And, and her objection to traditional morality, which says, oh, it's all about self-sacrifice. You just help other people and, uh, and think of them first. Uh, no. That simply uh, encourages people to take advantage of other people. It, it encourages them to make themselves worse off in order that they can get the benefits of, of being worse off and, and get other people to shower them with money or, or the government to shower them with money. Uh, so we want to encourage people to be um, independent, strong-minded, uh, but at the same time good citizens. Uh, and that is actually his her idea of, of selfishness. But because the word has traditionally meant something different, people think, oh, you know, it's all devil take the hindmost, uh, capitalism red in tooth and claw, um, no regard for other people. Uh, it's, it's not that at all. We live in a rather different world from the one Ayn Rand lived in when she wrote The Fountainhead and Atlas Shrugged. So what value – I mean you just – just published a book about the ideas of Ayn Rand. Um, what value do you think she still has today and what do you think her legacy will be? Well, I think that uh, hmm, on, on many levels, I, I think probably uh, that um, there's a sort of philosophical level and, and then there's, there are more practical levels and, and certainly on the philosophical level, the fact that she worked out a way to integrate so many different parts of uh, philosophy, I, I think is quite interesting um, and, and, and new uh, and, and radically different. Um, and she, she brought and brings new ideas on life, on personal morality, on politics and, and economics, all based, she says, on reason, using your mind. Now, that's actually a very powerful uh, idea that it's not about what you happen to like, it's about what, what works, what you, what, what you can work out about the world. It, it's an objective uh, morality rather than just one that you just choose because it sounds good or you came across it in a book. Um, and that's, what, to her, the, the, the virtue of uh, selfishness. And the same in politics uh, and economics as well, that these are political systems that are founded um, on rational uh, principles. Um, and, and I think another thing I would say that, that, she, that she's going, going, is remembered for um, is really her sort of robustness that she believes all this so strongly <laughs> and that uh, um, there's, there's no gray in Ayn Rand. Um, <laughs> you, you either use your reason um, or you're revolting against reason and, and, and you, then you're all, all over the place. Um, she's an absolutist only in the sense of she's absolute about reality. Um, and that, um, 
uh, although it causes her views to be seen more like a religion sometimes than a philosophy. But at the same time, it's it's very robust when it comes to arguing these things. And so often, you know, we argue about markets and the choice and competition and all these things. And, and, and people on the other side say, oh, well, yeah, that's just that's just your your view. Uh, but no, she's able to root it in something to say, no, this is this is actually all part of a single system and it's a rational system. Very difficult uh, for people to argue against that. Free Thoughts is produced by Tess Terrible. If you enjoyed today's show, please rate and review us on iTunes. And if you'd like to learn more about libertarianism, find us on the web at www.libertarianism.org.